This uh, program is on the subject of antennas. Antennas are important in radio communication system design, and designing an antenna is surrounded by a lot of mystery and mathematics, but don't be frightened. The manufacturers of antennas have made the subject a lot simpler, and all that's necessary is to select the proper antenna for the job. You don't have to design an antenna. To tell how an antenna works, uh, we should first review some fundamentals. And you probably know that uh, when there is an electron current flowing in a wire, there is a magnetic field that surrounds the wire in some fashion uh, like this. And you're probably familiar with uh, electric fields also, perhaps from your experiences with static electricity. And a radio wave is a combination of magnetic and electrical fields. And of course, that's why it's often referred to as an electromagnetic wave. And it goes all the way back to 1864. James Maxwell, a Scottish physicist, derived a set of mathematical equations that uh, predicted the existence of these electromagnetic waves. He predicted uh, they could be reflected. He predicted they would travel at the speed of light. And he predicted the loss these waves would have with distance. And a lot of scientists at the time didn't believe these equations. Invisible waves that travel through buildings and people at the speed of light? Fantastic. And it was 20 years before anyone had the equipment to generate a radio wave to prove he was right. Maxwell's equations say that if the magnetic field is made to change very rapidly, this magnetic field here, it'll produce an electric field at right angles to the magnetic field, uh, all around the magnetic field, some fashion like this. And this uh, electric field is also varying rapidly because of the varying magnetic field that produced it. This electric field, by the way, just exists in space. And since space has no free electrons, there's no current that flows anywhere. Maxwell's equations also say that if the electric field is varied quite rapidly, it'll produce another magnetic field, something like this, in all directions. And since the magnetic field is thus produced is varying rapidly, it produces another electric field which produces another magnetic field, and the whole process continues with these fields expanding and extending further and further away from the source, the speed of light. And so this is how an electromagnetic wave or a radio wave is produced. To start the process, a rapidly varying current is made to flow in a wire or a conductor like this. That produces the first magnetic field. So that wire is the transmitting antenna. To receive a radio wave, either the electric field or the magnetic field portion of the radio wave can be used. And most commonly in mobile radio work, the electrical field is used. If a wire is placed uh, in the same direction as the electric field here, there will be a difference in voltage from one end of the wire to the other. And current will flow, since there are electrons free to move in the wire. Uh, the current will alternate back and forth, too, as the electric field changes its direction. If a receiver is connected somewhere in the circuit, current will flow in the receiver circuit, and the receiver will respond to the radio wave. The magnetic field can also be used if the coil, is, this coil here is placed in the uh, direction of the field that's passing through it. And there's usually an iron ferrite core that's placed inside the coil to concentrate the magnetic field in the coil. The magnetic field of the radio wave will induce a voltage in this coil, which can be used to operate a receiver. This is most commonly used in receivers in the broadcast band, the AM broadcast band, although it has been used as an antenna in some VHF pages as well. As mentioned before, the majority of antennas used for base and mobile service make use of the electric field portion of the radio wave. And one example of uh, such an antenna is the half-wave dipole. And it's named a dipole because it has two poles. Uh, it's some instant one end is positive, uh, the opposite end is, is negative. Connections to the dipole are usually made in the center, although it is possible to, uh, to feed it from one end with some suitable transformer or impedance matching device. Antennas are made to be attuned or resonant length for best efficiency. In the case of a transmitting antenna, to radiate the strongest possible radio wave, we wish to have the maximum possible current flowing in the antenna. But the inductance, natural inductance of the antenna, may raise the impedance, preventing high currents from flowing. 
Even a straight piece of wire has some series inductance, as you see in the diagram. The longer the wire, the more inductance it's going to have. But notice there's also some capacitance that exists from one part of this dipole to the other. If the antenna is made a certain length, the series inductance and this uh, capacitance will form a resonant circuit. The capacitance will offset the series inductance, and the antenna will then appear to be a lower resistance at its terminals. And this will allow the maximum radio frequency current to flow in the antenna. So you see an antenna is a complete circuit where current flows, even though it may appear to be just a, a single wire in space. Sometimes the question is asked, well, why not use a, a, a full, full wave antenna, or even one that's, that's longer? The answer is that a full wavelength antenna radiates in different phases along its length, and this causes the radiation pattern to break up into four maximums like this. So if the antenna is vertical, the minimum radiation is straight out horizontally, and so it's not very useful for mobile communication. Uh, mobile antennas or antennas longer than one wavelength uh, have the radiation pattern separate and even additional maximums and minimums. So for this reason, you won't normally find individual antennas longer than a half a wavelength in mobile radio work. What you will find, as you'll see later, are combinations or arrays of half wavelength antennas. Simple antennas can be used where uh, the range requirements are not that great. And there's no need really to use a high performance antenna if uh, the user only needs communication over short distances. One example of a uh, simple antenna is the ground plane, which you see here. It uses a quarter wavelength uh, antenna, vertical here, along with a set of horizontal radials, ground plane radials, which are close to a quarter wavelength uh, in size. The antenna and the radials form a resonant circuit when cut to the proper length, uh, similar to the dipole. The series inductance of the antenna is offset by the capacitance uh, between the antenna and the radials here. So the radials provide a return circuit for RF current flowing in the antenna. Some types of ground planes have the radials drooping downwards, which provides an impedance close to 50 ohms at the antenna terminals. Ground plane antennas are close to a dipole in their radiation. And I should mention that the standard of performance for most base station antennas used in mobile radio work is the half-wave dipole. You may find another standard used in textbooks and uh, also in microwave work. And uh, this other performance standard is the isotropic radiator. This assumes that the radiation pattern is perfectly spherical. And well, it's not possible uh, to build a practical antenna that has a perfectly spherical pattern of radiation, so the isotropic antenna is, is really only a theoretical concept. The dipole radiation pattern is a toroid shape. This is just two parts of it here, two uh, sides of it. It looks like a donut, actually. The vertical dipole has a minimum in radiation uh, directly above and directly below the antenna, so the energy that would have gone up or to the sky or down to the ground is concentrated out horizontally in all directions. And this gives the dipole a small amount of gain in the horizontal direction over an isotropic source. Turns out it's about 2.15 dB of gain. You may see this written as uh, 2.5 uh, dBi, 2.15 dBi rather, which means dB above an isotropic antenna. Antennas that are rated uh, relative to a dipole may have some gain, and you may see that expressed as dBd, dB relative to a dipole. Continuing with uh, simple antennas, another one you may see is the coaxial skirt antenna. This has a quarter wave radiator, but instead of ground plane radials, it has this uh, open-ended tube, or co coaxial skirt, as it's called, that uh, fits over the support pipe. This coaxial skirt here serves as a return for the RF current from the antenna, similar to the ground planes. The performance of uh, this antenna is similar to a dipole, uh, we do have directional antennas also used in uh, many applications. Here's uh, one example called the uh, cardioid antenna. And it can be made from a ground plane, as you see here, but uh, they're also available uh, using coaxial skirt antennas. There's a certain distance between the quarter wavelength radiator and this reflector, 
and this reflector is a tuned length. When RF radiation from the antenna strikes the reflector, the reflector will re-radiate most of the energy it picks up. And the length of this uh, reflector is such that uh, the re-radiated signal is out of phase with energy coming from the antenna. Now this causes a minimum of RF energy to be radiated in the direction of the reflector. The distance from the reflector to the antenna has been selected, so re-radiation from the reflector will arrive in phase with the antenna's radiation. And this reinforces the antenna's uh, radiation in the opposite direction, this way. So some gain results. The resulting pattern looks like this, uh, viewing it from above. Uh, this circle here is uh, just with a radiator alone. Uh, this, this pattern here in black uh, shows you the cardioid pattern, as it's called. It provides uh, a minimum of 20 dB in the direction of the reflector, minus 20 dB in the direction of the reflector, and about 3 dB of gain in the opposite direction. Uh, this resulting pattern is called a cardioid pattern since it's similar to, to a heart shape. The cardioid antenna doesn't provide a large amount of gain, just the 3 dB, but that 20 dB minimum could be very useful in reducing interference coming from one direction. Another type of antenna it's sold is the bidirectional array. And here we have two ground planes that are shown, but uh, they could also be coaxial skirt types or any other omnidirectional type for that matter. The two antennas are mounted in a support frame and they're spaced exactly one half a wavelength apart. And these coaxial lines uh, from the main line are of equal length, so RF is delivered to these antennas in phase. The antennas radiate in phase, so uh, RF energy coming out toward you or away from you will add together and this provides about 3 dB of gain over a dipole. However, RF energy traveling from one antenna toward the other will arrive 180 degrees out of phase due to the half wavelength distance that uh, it has to travel. So the RF energy cancels, or it's at least greatly reduced, off to both sides, left and right here. The radiation pattern viewed from the top looks like this. Off the broad side, there are two maximums with uh, about 3 dB of gain. And this is why it's often called the broadside array. Off the ends are the radiation minimums, which are about minus 20 dB below a dipole. A popular type of directional antenna is the Yagi, named after its inventor. And a typical design consists of three elements here, but only one of these, this one in the center, is the radiating antenna. The other antenna, other elements rather, are called parasitic elements, since they operate by picking up RF energy and re-radiating it. The reflector, which is slightly longer in length than the antenna, picks up and re-radiates energy in such a phase that uh, energy going toward the rear, this direction, is canceled, or at least greatly reduced. Energy re-radiated by the reflector towards the antenna will arrive in phase with the antenna's radiation due to the distance the wave has to travel. So it reinforces energy radiating away from the antenna, going from the reflector. The next element here is the director, which is slightly shorter than the antenna itself, and it picks up and re-radiates in such a phase to reinforce energy traveling toward the front, this direction here. It also helps to narrow the radiation pattern that results. You'll find some Yagi designs that have more than one director. Uh, the radiation pattern of a Yagi, by the way, has a few side and back lobes here, and as you see, one main lobe. Much of the radiated energy is concentrated into a narrow beam extending out from the antenna. And typically, a three-element Yagi has about 7 dB of gain compared to a dipole. Yagis with uh, more than a single director can have more gain. Yagi-type antennas do have the advantage of providing good gain at uh, low cost, but they do have some disadvantages. First, they're sharply tuned and they don't uh, really work over a very wide band of frequencies. Uh, by the way, the bandwidth of an antenna is normally defined as the bandwidth over which the VSWR is less than 1.5 to 1. A VSWR, the voltage standing wave ratio, is a measure of the reflected power from the antenna, which in turn depends on the impedance match of the antenna to the coax line. 
Manufacturers of uh, these antennas often provide a graph of VSWR versus frequencies uh, similar to this one. A VSWR of 1.5 to 1 is usually the highest acceptable in commercial service. And uh, you can see in this example here, the VSWR is, is less than 1.5 to 1 from uh, about 150 megahertz on up to about 160. So the bandwidth here would be 10 megahertz. Uh, some Yagi designs are even less than this. Uh, some are only 5 megahertz in bandwidth. If uh, you're placing both a transmitter and a receiver on a narrow band antenna like a Yagi, one of the frequencies may fall out of the antenna bandwidth. In this case, uh, it's recommended that the procedure might be to specify an antenna so the transmitter frequency falls within the bandwidth, but the receiver is not as critical to VSWR, and the antenna will still have some gain even though the receiving frequency might be outside the bandwidth. Because Yagis are sharply tuned, they're easily upset by surrounding conditions. For example, they lose most all their gain when the elements are covered with ice. So use another type of antenna if your proposed site has the possibility of icing. If you need additional gain from an antenna, one way to achieve it is to connect more than one antenna in an array. And here's a general rule for you. If antennas of equal gain are connected so they radiate in phase, and the energy from them is directed to the same point, then a 3 dB increase in gain results every time the number of antennas is doubled. And this is 3 dB over whatever each antenna gain is by itself. For example, consider two Yagi antennas connected together and aimed in the same direction. Each antenna alone has 7 dB of gain over a dipole, but the combination of the two connected together here provides 10 dB of gain over a dipole. Uh, notice that this 3 dB increase is obtained when the number of antennas here is doubled. If you need 3 dB more than this uh, 10 dB, it would require doubling the number of antennas. Uh, in other words, four of these Yagis would theoretically provide 13 dB. Eight of these Yagis would theoretically provide 16 dB. I say theoretically because the actual antenna gain might be reduced slightly by a loss in all these cables connecting the antennas together. Uh, some manufacturers will sell you the cables to connect two, four, or even eight of their antennas together for higher gain. And these are often called stacking harnesses. Another type of uh, directional antenna is the corner reflector, which looks like this. It has a dipole here mounted on a support, and in back of it is this reflector, which looks like an open book. Uh, UHF corner reflectors may have uh, solid sheet metal as the reflector, VHF types might have an open grid construction, which reduces wind resistance. Typically, corner reflectors have about 7 dB of gain over a dipole, and they can be connected together or stacked for higher gain, uh, just as the Yagis. The radiation pattern of a corner reflector looks like this. and This is viewing it from above, by the way. It has a wider beam than a Yagi type, and it radiates less off the sides and the back and it does have an advantage of a wide VSWR bandwidth. And it's not as sensitive to surrounding elements, surrounding objects rather, and, and ice forming on the elements. For mobile communications, most stations require an omnidirectional antenna, one that radiates in all horizontal directions. And it is possible to obtain gain from an omnidirectional antenna as well. Uh, this is done by vertically stacking the antennas in an array. And sometimes this is called a, a collinear array. The antennas are arranged along the same line. To see how this provides gain, consider this arrangement. If these two dipoles are, uh, radiate in phase, at some point straight out horizontally, uh, the RF energy will add. And for two dipoles, this provides 3 dB of gain over a single dipole. At some point above the array, up here let's say, the RF energy must travel different distances. And because the difference in travel time, the RF does not arrive in phase from each antenna, and as a result, there is less RF energy at this point. And the same is true for points that are, are below the array. So this is how the gain is obtained. RF energy that previously went up toward the sky or down toward the ground is now concentrated out straight horizontally. 
And uh, notice this gain is achieved in all directions around the array, just not the two that are shown on the diagram. So the toroid, or donut-shaped pattern of the dipole, uh, shown here from the side, by the way, uh, has been flattened by using these two dipoles in an array. If more than two dipoles are, array, are used in an array, then this pattern becomes much flatter. Uh, much more RF energy is concentrated out horizontally. In some cases, this narrow beam may be a problem. If the antenna is on a very high site, as you see here, this narrow beam may be above the area you're trying to cover, a city perhaps, and uh, you may have poor coverage. Some manufacturers provide antennas with what is called electrical beam tilt. And this is done by altering the phasing between dipoles and the array so that the maximum radiation occurs at some points below the antenna. A severe down tilt, if you extend this uh, quite far down, uh, may limit the maximum range of the system since the beam was going to strike the ground at some point. Sometimes uh, that's desirable since it can reduce interference uh, to and from some distant point. Antennas must often be mounted on the side of a tower, and as might be expected, this has some effect on the radiation pattern of the antenna. The pattern that results uh, depends on the spacing from the tower in wavelengths, the spacing here, and also depends on the cross-section size of the tower in wavelengths. As an example, if an antenna is uh, mounted one quarter wavelength away from the tower structure, the radiation pattern, uh, viewing it uh, from above here, resembles an off-center circle. Uh, this assumes that the, the width of the tower is less than about one-eighth of a wavelength. If the antenna is spaced uh, half a wavelength out from the tower, then you have two lobes, two maximums that uh, result. Uh, Three-quarter wavelength spacing results in a three-lobe pattern. And a full wavelength uh, results in a four-lobe pattern like this. And this last is about as close as omnidirectional as uh, you can obtain from side mounting. So we normally recommend a full wave spacing when omnidirectional coverage is required from a side mounted antenna. The exception, by the way, is 800 megahertz, where the wavelength is quite small. And here we recommend the maximum possible spacing from the tower for omnidirectional coverage. All these patterns assume, by the way, that the tower width is small compared to a wavelength. But what happens if the tower is really a big one, like a broadcast tower? Now, this is a difficult situation because each of the legs of the tower we are going to pick up and re-radiate RF energy in some unknown phase. And this results in a radiation pattern that has many, many maximums and sharp, deep minimums all around. And this has caused some severe coverage problems in some installations. And there's not much that can be done to provide an omnidirectional pattern in such a case. Uh, directional uh, antennas can be used to shield the tower from the antenna radiation, but of course that doesn't provide omnidirectional coverage. Some people have found that uh, mounting an antenna inside the tower structure, right inside the steel here, provides reasonably omnidirectional patterns, uh, where the openings in the tower steel are large compared to a wavelength. By the way, uh, wavelength is the number 984 divided by the frequency in megahertz. This gives you the wavelength in feet. Or in the metric system, 300 uh, divided by the frequency in megahertz gives you the wavelength in meters. With mobile antennas, the best location is uh, in the center of the car roof. And this is usually free of obstructions, and the metal roof of the car uh, provides a ground plane for the antenna. Unfortunately, the installation here requires a large hole in the car, which is objectionable to many owners, and routing the coaxial cable from the rooftop uh, down to the radio is often difficult. So many people choose to put the mobile antenna on the trunk lid. Uh, this doesn't provide an omnidirectional radiation pattern because of the, the structure of the car. It will shield it in one direction. But in cities where there's quite a bit of uh, signal reflection, this may work well enough. Some improvement in the radiation pattern uh, can be obtained by use of a mobile gain antenna. And these are longer. A uh, portion of them uh, projects above the rooftop of the car and uh, gives you a little better pattern. The most common type of mobile gain antenna consists of a quarter wavelength antenna at the bottom, and then there's a coil, there's a bulge in the antenna, and then a top section of perhaps a, a longer uh, portion, perhaps uh, 
one half wavelength long. This coil here serves as the phase changer, so the top antenna will radiate in the same phase as the bottom. A radio wave striking both antennas, the top and bottom at once, I should cause the voltages induced to add up, thus achieving some gain. But uh, it's been found that uh, where there's considerable reflection of uh, radio signals in cities, for example, the full gain of such an antenna is not obtained. What may happen is you may have a wave of one phase striking the top. You may have a wave of different phase striking the bottom portion. And the voltages that are induced don't add up. The performance, by the way, is never worse than a quarter wave whip top, uh, excuse me, a quarter wave whip antenna. But uh, the expected gain that you're looking for may not be there. An interesting mobile antenna is a disguise antenna for those who don't wish to disclose there's a mobile radio in the car. And one form of these uh, looks like a standard AM FM radio antenna for the car, but it's really the mobile radio antenna. Uh, one of the most unusual types, uh, disguise antennas, is a side view mirror as mounted on the driver's door. Uh, the mounting of it is insulated from the car door and the entire support and the mirror head itself acts like an antenna. Of course, the radiation pattern is not omnidirectional because of its position, but for limited range applications, it can still be useful. This concludes our presentations on antenna, and I hope this information will be of use to you in your work.